the Raspberry Pi Pico is small, but it's still a bit big to put on a PCB. So let's have a look at some smaller alternatives and how we might use one of these RP24 based boards to make a MicroPython gaming console. Hi and welcome to Bytes and Bits. I've been using the Raspberry Pi Pico in quite a few of my recent projects. And if you've been following some of my videos, you'll know I've been working towards a Pi Pico powered handheld games console. Now for this project, I'll be using a small SPI LCD panel and, and some buttons for the game controller. Now eventually I'll need to move the test circuit onto a printed circuit board uh, to turn it into a usable device. And that's why I started to look at some of the smaller RP2040 boards. Now if, if you're not already familiar with the Raspberry Pi Pico, it, it's basically a bare bones RP2040 microcontroller on a very useful circuit board that gives you almost full access to the processor's IO pins. It's breadboard friendly, so you can easily build up your circuits. But when it comes to embedding it into a small device, it, it actually takes up quite a large area. And that's just simply to get the processor onto your design. Now there are a range of smaller development boards. And the one I'm going to use today is the XIAO RP2040 from Seed Studio. Now this is a very neat package. Uh, it's around the quarter the area of the Pi Pico. Uh, and as with the Pico, you, you can either solder some header pins onto the board or you can actually solder it flat onto your circuit board if you're making up a PCB. Now it houses an RP2040 microcontroller with the usual 264 kilobytes of RAM and two megabytes of onboard flash memory, and all of that running at the normal standard speed of 133 megahertz. So, so, so basically you've got a Raspberry Pi Pico on a smaller footprint. Now, now power and programming for this device is via a USB type C port, and you've got then the normal boot button along with a very handy reset button. So you don't have to disconnect the USB lead every time you need to reset, reset or restart your um, microcontroller. Now, now being smaller though, does of course mean that you have less output pins to play with. But as you'll see, by, by cleverly choosing the right GP pins, um, Seed haven't restricted the usefulness of the device. So you have 11 digital pins available around the edge of the board. But as the RP2040 it is able to use its pins for a wide variety of interfaces, you can, you can choose to set them up as either four analog pins, you can have up to 11 pulse width modulated pins, there's an I2C interface on there, an SPI interface, and a UART interface. And of course, um, depending on how you choose to use your 11 pins, you will have um, varying combinations of those functions. So if you only need a few IO pins, th th there's no issue. Um, if, if these 11 available pins are enough, then you're just good to go as it is. But if you need more, then you're gonna to have to do a little bit of extra work. So for my handheld console, I need to have an SPI interface to connect to the LCD panel. I'll also need to have at least one pulse width modulated pin to give me some sound output. And then I'm going to need around about 10 digital IO pins for the game controller buttons. Now, and as you can see, um, this just simply isn't going to fit onto the 11 pins on the board. So, so we're gonna need a different way of connecting everything together. So, so this is really why the Seed device um, has, has chosen the pins that it has. So for the SPI channel, we've got channel zero, um, which is using um, pins GP2, GP3, and GP4 on the RP2040. And those have been broken out to pins D8, D9, and D10 on this um, particular XIAO2040 board. Um, I can also then use pin D7 for the chip um, select signal. 
pin D6 for my data command signal. And I'm going to choose then D0 for my reset pin. And, and then that gives me the full connection that I need for my ST7789 LCD driver chip. So for the extra digital I.O. we'll have to use the I squared C interface. Now this lets you connect external integrated circuits that provide some extra capabilities of over a simple two wire serial bus. So for this test project, I'm using a 16-bit I.O. expander, and that will give me an extra 16 digital I.O. pins. Uh, but the same two wires can connect to multiple devices, um, each working at their own I squared C address location. So I could, if I wanted to, for example, connect up to eight of these 16-bit I.O. expanders, and I could then add on some extra analog I.O. for analog joysticks, um, etc. Um, so the I squared C, um, or, or, or inter-integrated circuit as, as it stands for, is, is a serial um, bus. Um, so it's actually going to be quite a bit slower than connecting directly to reading an I.O. pin on the processor. But we can run it at 400 kilohertz, and it only needs five bytes to be sent to read all of the 16-bit um, pins on my I.O. expander. So, so that isn't really going to um, impact our performance too much in this project. Um, plus, um, as we'll see in the full project tutorials, um, we can actually hide this serial processing time away by using our second core. Now after SPI and I squared C, that, that leaves us three digital I.O. pins left over. And these both have analog capabilities and also PWM capabilities. So, so that's going to be more than enough for either our mono sound or, or we could actually then go of course to stereo sound output. Now, Looking at the breadboard layout, uh, you may wonder if um, I've actually saved any circuit board space, um, as, as this I.O. expander chip is actually quite large. Now, now the IC I've used here is, is mainly to allow me to test this on breadboard. In the final design, uh, I'll move towards some surface mount technology, so, so the footprint of this device will, will almost disappear. So also, on, on the final circuit board design, this I squared C interface, or, or as I said, inter-integrated circuit um, bus, is going to help out with routing. Um, so I'm probably going to have a cluster of buttons either side of the display. And what I could do here is I could use an 8-bit IO expander on each side. Um, but each of these then will let me connect the 8 digital I.O. channels back to the processor board by only having to route the two I squared C um, um, pins. Um, so this should hopefully then let me get to a single sided PCB design, um, which I can then easily make at home. Uh, and again, th that will be another set of videos on, on home PCB fabrication. So for now, the, the processor, screen and gamepad are all up and working, leaving just the sound to sort out. But I couldn't resist trying the console out with a little game just to see how well it's performing at, at this point. So I'd been using a version of Asteroids for some computer studies tutoring I was doing, and that seemed like an ideal game to port over to this project. So the, the entire game is built using vector graphics, so it only needs the built-in line drawing routines from the frame buffer object that I'm using to get a, a decent um, frame rate. Now, as you can see, hopefully um, here on the screen, the, the little RP2040 is making a very good attempt at running the game. And, and this is with it using full polygon in polygon collision detection. So it's actually putting quite a bit of processing load on the microcontroller at, at certain points in the game. Um, and I, I did, in fact, I did need to optimize the code a bit, um, but um, that did then let me run this code without getting too much of a slowdown as the player ship gets close to an asteroid, and, and that's when the the polygon and polygon de um, collision detection kicks in. Uh, but, but having said that, um, having the game slow down at certain high processor loadings is almost part of the charm of, of coding on these low power devices. Um, and anyone who's, who's played games on the old 8-bit home computers will know exactly what I'm talking about. 
So this video um, was really to introduce the idea of, of things like these SEED XIAO RP2040 boards um, and, and showing them that uh, they are actually a very useful alternative to a full-size Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, and again here, m many thanks to SEED Studio for supplying me with a sample board for this project. Now, over the next few videos, I'm going to be covering the coding behind building up this console and the hardware um, to help you get the SPI screen working at a usable frame rate, um, using the second core to do some um, multi-core processing and, and multi-threading, uh, and that will then help me optimize um, and share the processing load. I'll also be showing you how to use the I squared C interface and, and then of course how to out add sound to the to the project. So, so please do make sure that you subscribe to the channel so you get hold of all of these videos as I produce them. Have fun using your Raspberry Pi Pico or do please try out some of these smaller boards such as the Seed Studio board um, for your for your making projects. I look forward to seeing you in another video very soon. So, bye for now. For more games programming, electronics projects, and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and visit my website.